we're all going to fall today. You might as well get on the ground and be where you're going to end up being so that you're not so worried about making a mistake about falling on your butt. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 159, and thanks for coming by. On today's episode, we hear from Mr. John Call, though you may know him better as the anabolic acrobat, Juju Mufu. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on the traditional martial arts, two times every week. Welcome. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm your host for the show, as well as the founder here at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out. I hope you enjoy your time. We've had a slew of new wholesale customers lately. Why? Maybe it's the free shipping on every order, or maybe it's the fact we don't have minimum orders. If you're a school owner, head on over to wholesale.whistlekick.com, or you can just hit whistlekick.com, and we've got a link at the top of the page. If you're not a member, please help us out. Tell your school owner or purchaser about us. We'd love to have you as a customer. You can find our show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, and you're definitely going to want to check those out for this episode. We've got a lot of stuff loaded in over there you're going to love. And that's also the easiest place to sign up for our newsletter. As a thank you for joining, we're going to send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, which is an exclusive podcast episode. Our newsletter keeps you up to date on what's going on here at headquarters, upcoming show guests, and even discounts on products. I first learned of today's guest through an online video someone shared. I was stunned at his strength and flexibility, especially considering his large size. It was clear that this was a man with extreme athleticism. While I'm no tricker, I admire the movements many of them are capable of, and I see the influence they've had on today's martial arts competitions. It wasn't until I heard him on a fitness podcast that I learned Mr. John Call started his journey as a traditional martial artist. The man many know only as Juji Mufu, who gained notoriety on America's Got Talent for doing a split across two chairs while holding a weighted barbell overhead, came from the same beginnings as most of us. When I heard more of his story, I knew we had to have him on the show. Well, he's here today, and let's give him a welcome. Mr. Call, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. You are our first tricker. If, if you're okay with me labeling you as such. That works for me. All right, <laughs> cool. Well, we're going to get to know you better as we go through, as we, we talk about your martial arts present and your future, but we always start with the past. Nice, easy question. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, I was about 13 years old, and it was right after a bunch of my friends broke up with me, so I didn't have any friends. And it was like that for almost a year before I befriended this new kid in school, and my self-esteem was really low. And he invited me to to join a Taekwondo class with him um, as a guest, and I did, and I was hooked, and I'm still best friends with that guy today. (laughs) Wow. Okay. So we got a couple of things in there. First off, the kid that you became best friends with in your early teen years is still your best friend. A couple decades later. Oh, yeah. We still text each other. That's that's fantastic. I mean, that that says a lot about the relationships that can come out of martial arts. And, and I'm guessing that a lot of the listeners have people kind of the same way, right? I, I was at an event this past weekend, and I'm looking around the room saying, you know, I've known them for 23 years, and I've known them for 25 years. And most of the listeners know I'm not that old. I mean, I'm, I'm in my I, – I, I think I'm on the tail end of being able to say I'm in my mid-30s, but – Regardless, if you jumped into to martial arts because he invited you and you stuck with it enough that he became your best friend, there must have been something about Taekwondo that engaged you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just it was my first introduction to fitness, pretty much. I mean, I was out of shape when I got into it. And even looking back now, it, it was still sort of ahead of its time in terms of just, just it's such an amazing physical fitness experience just to go through a traditional martial art like that. They get you right in there, right from the first class, doing high kicks and trying to do the splits and even sparring just a, a month after you know you reach your first belt and katas and just all the above. That stuff is amazing in retrospect. Just to think about how much, how much it engages you. 
what was your mindset like going into that first class? You know, I, I think we can, a lot of us, maybe the vast majority of us listening can relate to that kind of low self-esteem piece as we start martial arts. There seems to be something really consistent about those people that jump into martial arts and take some path with it that we're missing something in our life. So you spoke to that. What did you think when you got in there? Uh, <laughs> I was, well, I, I was just sort of amazed. I mean, it was, it had, it had so many things there. I was too young to really see them all. I mean, I see them all now as I've gotten older, but when I was there, it was very immersive. I was too young to really, you know, look at it analytically, you know, piece by piece, what the whole experience was comprised of. But I mean, one of the things was just the community of the individuals involved. It was, it's more than a typical, you know, spinning class or aerobics class or CrossFit class. It's, it's much, it's so much more than that. And just the technical aspect of it, the, the patterns you go through, it's just, there's so much going on It for a 14 year old kid getting into it. There's, it's really interesting because there's so much to do. It is not boring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and unfortunately the irony seems to be that, that that age, the age that I would say, excuse me, that I would say most needs martial arts. That's when people seem to drop because it's not the cool thing, right? There, it's not, you know, most of your friends aren't doing it, but I'm going to guess that by having your best friend there that helped that kept you in. Oh yeah. I mean, I could tell you, you know, fast forwarding a little bit when I stopped attending the classes for many reasons, uh, he soon stopped going as well because we sort of formed a bond and relationship with it. We both got into tricking, it, taekwondo for me was my entrance into that and for him tricking was sort of an exit to it as well but when i left it was really hard for him because of the relationship we formed going into it and and yeah so <laughs> right, right on now just to tie up the last bit on this first question before we move on there may be some folks out there that aren't quite familiar with the term tricking We've got people from all different martial arts, all different ages, and honestly, all over the world. How would you define tricking? Tricking is an aesthetic blend of flips, twists, and kicks. Um, tricking used to be uh, called martial arts tricking. That's where it was really derived. It's been shortened to be called tricking as different people started to adopt styles and movements more from things than just the martial arts to the point it became collectively known simply as tricking, but it is an aesthetic blend of flips, twisted kicks. Yeah. And for people that are listening, when you attend a tournament and you see someone that does a form, kata, pumse, tool, routine, pattern, whatever you want to call it, and there's something in the middle that just makes you say, what is that? And it involves them jumping, twisting, flipping, and they do something absolutely crazy that makes the crowd go gasp, gasp. That's probably something out of the tricking world. Right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now we've got a bit of context for who you are, how you got started, and probably some glimpses into where we're going to go. It's all about the stories here on Martial Arts Radio. Tell us your best martial arts story. Uh, um, <laughs> now, you know, one really cool story I have, um, you know, I don't know why I remember this one so well, but I was in black belt camp and black belt camp is like where the black belts go once a year to, you know, work out together for three or four days. It's sort of like a little mini boot camp type thing for the black belts of the organization. And, you know, this, <laughs> this is going to be an underwhelming story overall to be honest but something <laughs> don't, really don't important set it up like that <laughs> <laughs> something really i don't know why this one sticks with me but we got out there's a big field okay and it's a little damp and it's a cloudy day and there's a few black belts in the front talking to a field filled with like 200 to 300 people so it looks really old school you know something you'd see in an old martial arts movie where all these people are spaced out evenly across a very large area Really cool looking. And the guy in the front tells us, uh, okay, first thing I want you guys to do is sit down on the ground, lay down on the ground, 
Now I want you to roll on your stomach. Now I want you to swim. Now I want you to roll around like a pig. He basically had us move and roll around all over the ground and get wet and muddy before we even started working out. And he said, we're all going to fall today. So you might as well already get on the ground and be where you're going to end up being <laughs> so that you're not so worried about making a mistake about falling on your butt or something. That little practice actually carried through <laughs> for me when I was tricking as well, you know, later down the road when I'm out, you know, on the fields and stuff, I would be kind of weary about falling and crashing when I started my session. And so I just remember that day and just get on the ground and roll around and, you know, get in the grass and get a little dirty before I started so that it wasn't such a big deal when I fell, you know, and I don't know, that has so many implications in life and, and work and just anything you can think of. Just when you start, just screw up to begin with, sort of, and just get over it so that you can get to work. <laughs> I don't think that's underwhelming at all. You know, I, I think the brilliance there is you're, you start with the worst case scenario, being on the ground, getting dirty. And once that's happened, it's all uphill. You you can't go any lower than that, and, and I, I just I think the, there's a simple elegance there. So if you tell that story again, don't don't set it up as underwhelming because I, <laughs> I think it's very brilliant. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, I'm, illustrated in that I'm way. glad I'm glad you liked it. Yeah, I don't know. It just it's just stuck with me, and yeah, that's it's a perfect way to look at it. But yeah. just imagine a, a bunch of fields full of guys in clean pressed geese <laughs> with their stripes and their patches, and then the guys in front just tell them, "Now get in the mud. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to spar for a few hours." Oh man, it was it was cool. I don't know. I like that one. I don't know if I've ever sparred in mud. I've sparred I've sparred on grass and wet grass and gravel and pavement and dirt. And certainly inside on every surface you could imagine, including AstroTurf, which is one of my least favorite surfaces to, to work out on. But I don't know about mud. There must have been some mud at some point. I was a kid, right? I mean, kids find mud in the weirdest places. <laughs> I don't think that was the plan. It was just supposed to be a normal field. It just had rained out there for days before we got out there. And we're like, well, let's just keep going according to plan. you know. And it just happened to turn into like a muddy, really muddy field. Well, kudos to your instructor for embracing the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> so other than tricking and, and you know, the related aspects there, what else are you into? Do you have any other hobbies? You mentioned fitness early on. So is there there's something else going on there? Oh, yeah, of course. So um, just a little timeline here. I started martial arts between the ages of 13 and 14 sometime around there. I got into tricking when I was about 15. Um, I got into weightlifting when I was 18. I did that because I wanted to improve my tricking practice because, you know, from what I could observe, all the best uh, athletes in the world lifted weights to improve their strength and their performance. So that's why I got into weightlifting when I was 18 was to improve my tricking. And uh, I'm 31 now. I got into bodybuilding aspect of it about five years ago. So, you know, the thing is when I transitioned, it wasn't a transition. It was just doing the next thing as well. So a lot of people in their, you know, athletic career or fitness career or whatever, they, uh, they, they transition and they leave the other one behind. So for me, it was, I, I never left the other one behind really. Um, I went from Taekwondo to tricking to weightlifting to bodybuilding. And now I do pretty much all of it. I don't really embrace the traditional martial arts practice anymore, but every now and again, I will work some hand combos and I'll use normal kicks in my tricking combos. And, uh, you know, just a few weeks ago, I had a sparring match for the first time with a friend in a long time and it was all still there. I still love it all. I just, I just, I do it all. There's only so much time in the day, right? And we've got to look at what it is that we, we want to accomplish and, and work hard on that. And yeah, I can see the natural progression that you're talking about with stacking these things. And I completely agree in it about the weightlifting part. Resistance training is something that I think martial arts as a environment is starting to embrace. And I think it's none too soon. You know, I, there, there's only so much that you can get out of manipulating your own body weight. And you can do a lot, but... I'm sure you can attest to the fact that your jumping 
and your your rotational speed and the other things that you need are much greater after all of your weightlifting. Oh, of course. Absolutely. It, it helps tremendously. Um, also with resilience as well in terms of like therapeutic value, if you have nagging injuries or something, um, the weightlifting is sort of a different stress on the body and it's complementary to some of the more explosive, uh, snappy, sometimes uh, fairly destructive uh, values. Some of them uh, traditional and especially tricking uh, type of martial arts has in the body. It's, it's a little more um, zappy, I guess it's hard to describe. It's, it's snap. It's a lot snappier. So something that's just more static strength, uh, more slow and controlled, you know, through weightlifting uh, definitely complements it. I mean, in fact, I mean, one of the things that really got me into weightlifting to begin with was Bruce Lee's book, the art of expressing the human body. I mean, you could look through his training logs and see that the guy was, doing lots of weighted exercises with barbells and stuff. I mean, he spent most of his time, it seems like just, you know, counting how many punches and kicks he did in preparations for movies and stuff, but he was still always uh, doing strength and resistance exercises. And, you know, I think just looking ahead at modern martial artists, even in MMA, how many of them don't lift weights is the question now. Right. Right. And, I don't remember where this quote came from, so I'm certainly not trying to steal it and pass it off as my own, but stronger people are harder to kill. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that works. So, yeah, I, I, you know, it's come up on, on some episodes. I lift weights, you know, and not from a bodybuilding perspective, from more of a, I, I'm not sure how I feel about throwing out the term functional, um, with that, because I think it can get a little overused and, and encourage debate. And so I'm not trying to not incite anything with you or, or any of the listeners. You know, I mean, I get hate mail from <laughs> time to time, no matter what I do. Right. But, you know, if anybody out there well, thinks I'm picking on them, it's not how I mean it. But if you if well, you see me, I'm not a, a big guy and because that's not my goal. My goal is to supplement the rest of my training, you know, kind of like what you had been doing at least until I'm guessing the bodybuilding piece came on. Correct. Yeah. When the bodybuilding uh, came on, it became less about functional aspects of, I mean, let me just cure you of the, of the functional, uh, uh, kind of apprehension you had there. I could tell you're a little careful in using the word. It's very simple. Um, whenever you, someone says, uh, is this functional training? You always ask them functional for what, that's it. I mean, functional for what? If if your job is to be a contortionist, then your training has to help with the function of being a contortionist. If your job is to throw a roundhouse kick and break wood, then whatever your training has to complement that in a way where that's functional for that goal. So functional training as a whole has no meaning unless you know what the function behind it is. So that's it. But um yeah, the the weightlifting, see, and adding the bodybuilding to it, the function at that point came to be, I want to look bigger. <laughs> I want to be a larger fellow throwing these acrobatic moves. So the bodybuilding was functional. The bodybuilding methodology was functional for that goal. Does that make sense, Jeremy? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I'm curious, what was the motivation there? Was this um, Was this for aesthetics? You know, the the stereotypical, I want to pick up girls, so I want bigger muscles, or was there more to it than that? Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, in terms of like picking up girls, the only person I've ever been with is my wife, so you can just throw that one out the window right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's never really been, yeah, I mean, I'll just be honest with you. I mean, that's never really been one of my strong points is women, so um, no, it wasn't even for picking up women. It wasn't because my self-esteem was low. My self-esteem had already been boosted tremendously through um, martial arts tricking and the weightlifting. It was um, – I think there was a couple things behind it. One was I spend you know, two hours a day training or whatever, and I look like a normal guy. I just – I wanted people to, to actually see the result, I suppose, and to experience what that's like when people recognize you. You know, because what people perceive you as is, you know, bigger equals stronger. Of course, that's not true, you know, but hell, I just wanted to see what would happen, you know, if, if I did that. And I was getting a little bit older with the, with the tricking and the, um, 
you know, I had reached kind of past my peak in that. I mean, usually your best years in that are between 19 and 23. I was 26, 25, somewhere around there. I was like, you know, I just want to build some muscle because I eat. I know exactly how to eat. You know, I'm very, very strong. All I have to do is just do this. I know how to do it. I just want to see if I can do it. And I did it. <laughs> does that does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. You know, I'm, I'm a I'm a firm believer in in adding muscle. If it fits your goals, you know, I, you know, I think a lot of people would say that when you add muscle, you lose flexibility and anyone that is familiar with you, and maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about your online persona and some of the things that you do, and then we can pull it back because you counter that you are a, a big, strong man. And you're also a very flexible man. <laughs> so, yes. Um, what I tell people is they ask me a lot. So it's a very common question is how, do, how are you so big and so flexible? What I tell them is that the size does not affect my flexibility at all. In fact, I'm more flexible than I've ever been. Flexibility, I define it as having uh, control at in ranges of motion, higher ranges of motion. Control is strength and coordination combined. So a larger muscle, when you train it, can, you know, the training that you incur upon that muscle to increase size is often has a strength and coordination component to it as you're contracting the muscle, as you're trying to isolate it, as you're trying to, you know, push more weight. If you just apply these, uh, principles to your flexibility training, the muscle does, it is, I could tell you, it's actually helpful for flexibility. The only difference is it's difficult to achieve an absolute range of motion with more muscle because there's more muscle to get in the way of more muscle. You see what I'm saying? So you can imagine a smaller gymnastics girl doing a back bend. Well, there's less back muscle to get in the way of her doing a bridge. Whereas I have uh, a very large amount of back muscle. I have a very large back. It's going to be harder for me to get into that range of motion, but you know, things like splits, man, they're, they're so easy for me. I got them on lock. I know exactly how to train for them. Uh, high kicks, no problem. Every now and again, my quads are going to get in the way of my abdomen, you know, as they, but I can still kick really high. <laughs> so definitely the, the size does not nearly affect the flexibility in terms of what most people think. Right on. And we're going to talk a little bit more about flexibility, I'm sure, when we get into the book section. Oh, um, sure. Yeah, that's my specialty. <laughs> I, I know it is. I know it is. A little, little bit of foreshadowing for the listeners out there. One of the things that I like to ask all of our guests is about a difficult time in their life. I find that martial artists seem to have kind of a unique perspective on how to handle adversity. Tell us about a time in your life where things didn't go real well and how you work through it. Hmm. You know, just to preface it, I haven't really experienced a very major uh, loss in my life yet. Luckily, um, I still have all my family members and friends. I haven't really experienced a loss of a loved one, loved one yet, thankfully. So I'm not sure how I would handle that yet, but I'll have to one day when that happens because it will. But I would say, you know, probably the worst time of my life was uh, between the ages of 22 and 24. And it's just that age when I think, at least in America, uh, people expect you to be an adult, to be responsible. And you don't yet have the experience of an adult to do that. So there's a lot of pressure on you to get a job or, you know, move out and be independent and it's really scary because uh, you don't have the the experiences the you just don't have the experiences you you don't have had enough years of doing things to really do that so i can remember you know my parents being hard on me you know and just it was it was just a a, a tr tricky time in my life and you know i i did, the good thing that came from it was um i dove into philosophy he heavily like reading books to sort of troubleshoot my life. So I read a lot of Emerson, Nietzsche, um, Bertrand Russell, all sorts of stuff, just diving into these old books. And I just studied them and, and 
repattern a lot of my thinking patterns and it's really, really changed my attitude. And that was a great way to change my filter for how I see the world from, from reading those books during that time of my life, which, you know, it's hard to describe any exact experience that was, you know, difficult. It was just, it was just being too young and having people expect too much of you at a time when you weren't ready for it. So those reading those things, uh, paid off quite a bit as I've gotten older. <laughs> you know, a lot of people will turn to reading material, but you know, I don't know that I've ever known someone that turned to philosophy books during that difficult time. And, and that kind of tugs at my heartstrings a little bit because I was a philosophy major in college. A lot of people don't. Nice. Know yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I probably read a good portion of what you read and, and found that I hated as much as I loved philosophy because of the different <laughs> perspectives, but mm -hmm. all of it makes you think. And it sounds like that's what you needed at that point was some thinking time. I think so. Yeah. Right on. Now through your journey, if you had to pick someone that was the most influential person, who would that be? Hmm. I can't really pinpoint anyone exactly, but I can tell you like people often ask me who my inspiration or hero is in the fitness industry. You know, people uh, coming from fitness culture, um, they'll ask me who, who my favorite person is. Um, I really liked Jack LaLanne. Um, do, do you know who Jack LaLanne is? I do. I do. An incredible yes. man. Oh, yeah, I know. So just the amount of sheer energy that guy had and just his attitude. He was crazy. He was just a crazy man. And he just kept going up until almost 100 years old. That's that's inspiring for me to see someone twice, three times my age, four times my age. I don't know. He was almost four times my age, three times my age. Okay, I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just to see someone just do it that long and just never stop. It's just mind boggling to me. I can't even, uh, I want to follow in those type of footsteps. And so sometimes when I don't feel like getting off the couch or when I'm going through a harsh week or when things just aren't working out too well, I think about, you know, think people like him who are still do well, he would still be doing it. Who are just so much older than me. It's just, ah, oh, just have so much respect for that. Yeah, when I think about somebody like him or people that I know in the martial arts that are older and still doing it, you know, we've had some of them on the show. They haven't stopped. And I think that that, that might be one of the keys to life. And I'm certainly not discovering this and I'm not, not claiming that, you know. But as long as you keep moving, right? I mean, we're, you know, what's the, the saying, you know, sharks dive they stop moving. You know, I think we're mm -hmm. kind of like that in a sense. The thing that, the thing that's, uh, that's interesting to me about those and what I'm, what I'm trying to figure out or what I'm trying to guess is going to happen is see, I'm still sort of peaking. Um, I could still get stronger. I could still build more muscle. I could still learn new moves. I'm still at, I'm still 31. You know, I got, I got more years than me before I start to see a, a slower decline and it's like, okay, I'll never be able to lift that much again, or I'll never be able to do that again. Let's be realistic. You know, I can't do what a 19 year old does in this way. You know, when I'm 45, it's just physics. It's just the way it works. But you know, how do they handle that when they, as they get older, they just, they have to sort of set their thermostat to a lower level and continue to do it, you know, even though they know they're not anywhere near what they were, there's, there's still, I guess maybe they figure out a way to continue making progress in the, in the mental aspect and the psychic aspect, perhaps. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think that that's a huge part of it. You know, when, when we consider martial arts as being about personal development, you know, it's, I think that the, the body's beginning to fail is another opportunity for growth because it, it forces you to redefine who you are and, and how you operate. And I'm starting to deal with a few of those things. You know, I've got some stuff going on, a couple of joint things that have lingered longer than I would like them to, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I'm addressing them and I'm working through them, but it, 
it forces me to consider my body and my relationship to my body in a different way. And I'm sure that that's going to continue as I move forward. But you're right. You're, you know, it's, you have a lot of headroom left for getting stronger, for getting better. I don't know if you're familiar with Louis Simmons. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and anybody out there, if you're not versed in the, the weightlifting community, Louis Simmons is, is a legend and he's, I want to say mid, mid to late fifties now. Yeah. Something and, like that. And still squats, I want to say 700 plus pounds. I mean, just a, an amazingly strong man. He's had a whole bunch of joint replacements. I mean, his, his story, if you swap out weightlifting for martial arts, I mean, would resonate for a lot of people. But, you know, when, when we compare ages, I mean, you know, you got 25, 30 years until you're where, where he's at. Mm -hmm. So yeah, keep, keep trucking. Right. I see it. That's what I'm talking about is I look, I look for people like that, um, who are still at such a high level so much later in life and to continue to have the interest in it, to find new, new things in it that are interesting and to see it continually in new ways. That's inspiring to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I love watching the, the older set, especially in martial arts, especially at a competition, because that's where you see the best performances. I mean, people yeah. that you just, you know, I don't care. And there, there's one gentleman who's been on the show. I'm not going to name names because I don't want to single him out over some others. But when I watch him do a kata at, at a tournament, the whole world stops and they watch him. And it's impressive. And there's something that comes with that expertise, having done those forms thousands of times. Whereas the rest of us, we don't have that expertise at that level. You know, it's not quite as obvious. We have to put in more effort and we should, and, and I will certainly continue to and, and hope to reach that standing someday. Yeah. <laughs> now I mentioned competition. This is a good time to ask, have you competed? I mean, you know, are there tricking competitions? Well, I, yeah, well, I competed in, uh, martial arts and Taekwondo, my, my organization at the time was ITA. I think it now it's now Tiger Rock. Um, so it's like a nationwide organization, but I competed in the tournaments there. As far as tricking goes, uh, there's really no competitions because it's such a subjective activity, way more subjective than, than organized gymnastics or cheer or something like that, which is still more of acrobatic. It's, it's very subjective <laughs> and more subjective than bodybuilding even. I mean, in terms of, you know, judging aesthetics, it's just, there's no way to judge it. So there's no way to compete in it. Um, so there's no organized organizations in it as well. There's just, um, a community of people online that organize events to get together and just have fun and work out and trick and perform and sometimes battle, but it's mm -hmm. not like competing. It's just sort of like, you know, it's like a little mock-up, like who's better, you know, like a, like break dancing. If you can imagine like the break dancing world, yeah. there's no championships so much to say. There's just, it's an underground movement more than anything. Rock on. Uh, <laughs> Master Simon Schur, who's been on the show and, and has become a friend. We put together a martial arts variant on the basketball game of horse. Oh, and, yeah, uh, that sounds fun. I'll, I'll, I'll link that video in the, in the show notes for anybody that might be new. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. That's where we put all that stuff. And I could see that happening in the tricking world. You know, he's a more traditional martial artist as I am. He's got incredible flexibility, much more than I do. But we battled it out, you know, doing everything from kicking and jump kicking. I think the final move i think we had to kick the flame out of a candle i think is what we did without touching it is that so, hard um on the video we make it look easy but there were a few takes yeah it was harder than i had expected it was fun you know it forced some creativity hmm i would use a round kick <laughs> oh absolutely um that was his move right to to pick if anybody hasn't played horse you know one person picks a shot you know, it comes from basketball and then the other person, other people have to replicate it. It was his turn. So he actually did it with a sidekick, if I remember correctly. And that was Whoa. the hard part. Yeah. So we weren't moving nearly as much air. 
<laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy competition? Was that something that, you know, they, is it something you miss? Mm, no, I don't miss it so much, but no, I absolutely enjoyed it. And it's, it, it was, so, it was so important to me that, I mean, that's how I got my side splits, for example, was my entire reason I even trained so hard to get my full splits, particularly the uh, the side splits, the middle splits, was because I wanted to put them in a free kata, free form, and get a first place trophy because, you know, that's quite an impressive skill to put into a, a free form. So I figured it'd give me higher points. And yeah, absolutely, it did. And, you know... I was getting into tricking at the time too. So I was like, I want to put 540 kick in there. I want to put, you know, a double leg in there and stuff. The thing that was uh, getting sort of annoying for me was uh, the organization was putting these kind of off and on restrictions for what you could do in a free kata. So sometimes they would allow backflip. Sometimes they wouldn't allow anything where the head was underneath the legs, you know, and if they had just decided like, no, you cannot do this for any competition ever in the organization, then that would have like, that would have been a little bit more authoritarian to me at the time, but it was almost as if on a tournament by tournament basis, you never knew whether they're going to allow certain moves or not. And that would make it difficult for me to plan like what my free kata was going to be, you know, it's like, well, well, this time, you know, I get there and they're like, okay, nothing inverted or you get zero points. I'm like, well, I had just designed a routine based around, you know, a couple moves in there, you'd have to improvise, but uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that was very professional. No. And, and certainly I think one of the things that has held martial arts back, and I've been pretty open about this on the show, my opinion here, one of the things that's held us back from being a bigger force is our refusal to agree on very many things. And one of the quietly spoken goals of this show is that martial artists realize that we have vastly more in common than we do different and a little bit of unity could go a long way i mean we're just gonna see karate in the olympics in 2020 yeah, it's far too long oh wow why so long <laughs> nobody could agree on the rules why did taekwondo get in sooner because there were only two huge divisions in rule sets so and there we go. Yeah. Now, if you could train with anybody, you know, anybody alive, anybody dead, you know, from any of the, the various worlds that you come from, who would you want to train with? You know, maybe someone I'd want to train with isn't someone in particular, but maybe during a certain time period. Okay. So maybe something along the lines of, uh, and this isn't just because it's the martial arts podcast, but I mean, <laughs> honestly, I'd, I'd be really interested to train with any group of people that lived during an era where there was no TV, electricity, social media, any of that stuff, and sort of pattern their entire lifestyle around, um, you know, their art of training, I guess. I mean, I'm still drawn to that in a way. I mean, maybe the samurais or something back hundreds of years ago, you know, you see these movies that sensationalize it, but you know, how far from the truth was that for real? I mean, these guys honestly didn't have anything really else to do other than farm and feed their family and build stuff. I guess the rest of the time they just spent, you know, practicing their art. I would love just to see some of the little tweaks and, and quirks and, and approaches they had towards things like that. I mean, I could I could train with anybody in the fitness industry, and, and to me, to be honest, it's, it's, I think it's going to feel about the same. You know, uh, experience just just someone that's that's not trying to impress me by how hard they can train, or you know, how long they can last, or scare me, or do anything like that. I just want to see someone who's lived during a time like that where there's nothing else, and just to be honest with it, and just this is how how we really do it. And we're not just trying to come off a certain way to be popular. This is just really how we do it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. You know, how, how much harder would you work on, you know, a 540 kick if doing it less than someone else meant you would die? I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> really kind of the attitude that you mentioned the samurai and, and, you know, a lot of these, 
people that these types of people that we might think back on, I mean, that was their motivation. I mean, yeah, they, they had to take care of their family. They had to do certain things, but they knew that at any time they could be called into battle and it was up close and personal battle. And, and I don't want to take anything away from our fighting forces today who put their lives on the line. But from what I've read, the mortality rates are a lot lower now than they were because, you know, one, I think we value life a little bit more now, but, you know, when you're face to face with somebody and, you know, you're drawing swords, there's a good chance you're both going to die. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a hardcore mindset for sure. I also think uh, a lot of those guys, maybe, you know, at that time, there's, there's less, there's less political, there's less, there's just a, there, there's a lot less things going on that can influence the experience of being with those type of people. I mean, they, these are almost like sort of like a monk, you know, but, but just different. I don't know how to describe it. I just, there's a certain aspect of it that, that sort of draws me and, you know, kind of forms this image in my head of what it might be like, but I'd love to be totally surprised. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. How about movies? Are you at all a movie guy? You like martial arts films? Uh, I used to watch a lot more martial arts films back when I was younger. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, well, not obviously, but <laughs> I mean, it's, it's my favorite is just Jackie Chan. I mean, I just, yeah. he was way ahead of his time. He was just way ahead of his time in terms of the entertainment value, his creativity, his use of structure and, you know, ladders and <laughs> whatever <laughs> else he could, he could find. It's just, he was so far ahead of his time in, in terms of constructing these things. I think the guy's brilliant. I don't know that there's anybody else that can hold a fight scene with such skill, such presence and humor all at the same time. Ah, you throw that in there too. That's just another thing that just made him that much better. It's just, he was funny too. He had so many yeah. things. He just, he was so unique and <laughs> it's not until, you know, like 15 years after his prime that you realize like, holy crap, Jackie Chan was awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he's been doing it forever. I mean, he's, he, if I remember correctly, he's knocking on 60 and he's still doing it. He's still doing his stunts. Mm hmm. And even though he was sort of a clown in his movies and his movies were, you know, you know, comical and, and kind of crazy, the guy was no joke. He was serious business. I mean, he'd break his foot and just finish filming the rest of the scenes for the movie. You know, he'd jump off a building, land onto a boat, slip it and break his ankle and continue filming. I mean, that takes some serious discipline. You know, he wasn't a prima donna by any means. He was. <laughs> Those those old martial arts values, those old disciplines he had from growing up and, you know, setting the foundation were always there. Yeah. And there's a bit of a parallel there for you, too. I, I think, you know, that traditional martial arts foundation and you've moved into something that, you know, I, I don't I don't think we have to hide the fact that tricking isn't a traditional discipline. It is a martial arts discipline. But. I would guess, and, and I don't know if you agree, hopefully you agree, because it's kind of the whole um, reason I invited you to come on. It's that traditional foundation that allowed you to move into the other things of, in your life and have success with them. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the way a martial artist sees a technical skill or the way they train um, for any sort of movement, a kick, a, a, you know, anything like that. And tricking, it's very similar. You have a very high respect for the, the technical aspect, um, how your body is reacting, where your body is, the state it's in. You're working with your body in order to get it to adopt these skills. And, you know, you, you coach gymnastics, I think you told me. Is that correct? I do, yeah. Okay, there, it's very similar there as well. There's a lot going on in terms of getting the body – and where you have to put your mind and the respect you have to have for these skills in order to execute and actually get your body to do them. And moving more into the fitness side later in my life, that was a tremendous, tremendous advantage I've had. I could do a lot of different things if people were to follow me on social media. Like, how does this guy do all this? It's because I have a respect for the technical component that comes from my martial arts background. I, you know, 
look, you know, deadlifting compared to a 720 butterfly twist, you know, it's a, it's like a tricking move. It's also in wushu. It's a martial art. That's a real skill. A deadlift is not nearly as, you know, difficult as something like that, but still I'm going to treat it with the same respect that I have for something like a 720 butterfly twist or a harder skill. Just the way you approach skills and see everything as sort of a skill in that way where you have a respect for it. I know I'm using the word respect a lot, but it's important. It's just, I'm not just counting. I'm not just doing three sets of 10. I'm not just doing workouts of the day. I'm not just beating my body into a pulp. I'm working with my body. I'm trying to do this better. It's a practice. Does that make sense? It does. And I, I don't think there's anything more martial arts philosophy than what you just said. I mean, that's, that's all any of us can hope to do with our training is to work with our body and to be present to how we're moving and why. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you mentioned one book earlier, the, the Bruce Lee book. Let's talk about other books. We'll leave yours for the end, but are there any <laughs> other books that you feel strongly about that our listeners might be interested in? In terms of, uh, training uh or just anything well let's start with training and then if there's something else that that you want to throw in let's hear that too hmm. uh you know most of the value i've attained from um reading any sort of training texts has been mostly things online just googling and looking at people's blogs and reading finding different authors uh pavel uh, the Russian kettlebell guy has written quite a few things that are very interesting, but you can find a lot of his uh, writings and links to his books online. Um, just going down the Google rabbit hole has more than anything helped me in terms of uh, attaining, you know, new training knowledge and stuff. I can't, I honestly can't recommend uh, any particular like hard copy book that I might have for things like that. I could tell you for flexibility, the one that uh, had the biggest impact on me, and I just have an opportunity here to give the guy credit, is Thomas Kurz. He wrote Stretching Scientifically, and that guy is brilliant. I think uh, thanks to him was the reason I got the splits to begin with, was reading his principles of training flexibility. So that's a classic for flexibility training, especially for martial arts. Since he comes from a martial arts background, he tailors a lot of his uh, – examples to kicking and mm. things like that. Mm. I'm not familiar with that book. I'm going to have to check that out. It's an easy one to find. Uh, the cover is him doing the splits, holding a baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right on. All right. So we'll talk about what you've got going on in a second, but before we get there, I want to talk about what's keeping you motivated because you're doing a lot. You're a, busy guy. You've got a lot of different irons in the fire. And at least from what I can tell, you are still fired up on all of it and, and just on life in general. What is it that's keeping you moving forward? I think there's a lot of things at play here, but just a couple that jump to mind immediately are um, one, when you reach a position where I'm at, where there's a lot of eyes on you, um, it seems like it's sort of hard to not be fired up for things when you can post a video on Instagram and get 400 people telling you how awesome you are. You know, <laughs> I mean, let's, it's very, it's very, uh, um, how, how do I say it? It's blunt, I, I, blunt, maybe it's just sort of, it's just human, I guess. It's hard not to be, uh, to get fired up about something when so many people are patting you on the back. Of I mean, course, I have to yeah. thank my fans and my followers so much for that because without them, um, I would still be doing it because I did it for 15 or 16 years with very little recognition just because I loved it. But uh, I think the thing that's motivated me all along during the times when you know, I didn't have as many people watching me or when it didn't even matter whether anyone was looking at me or not – was just having an idea for something, just seeing it in your head and thinking, hmm, have I seen that before? No. I need to be the first person to do that because someone's be me too. <laughs> Simple as that. I mean, I have a lot of ideas. It's just 
And every day I like to exercise my creativity in ways where I can come up with more ideas like that, just to see things differently, to create videos, content, information that's new and creates value for people that's never been done before yet. And I don't want to let people be do it. Mm, totally. All right. So tell us what you've got going on. I mentioned a couple of times you've got a book. I know you've got websites. I know you've got a lot of stuff that our listeners are going to be interested in. So let's have it. This is your commercial time. <laughs> well, I wrote a book recently called Legendary Flexibility. You can go to legendaryflexibility.com to purchase it. It's about 250 pages. It's an ebook, about 17 bucks. It took me a very long time to write it. I calculate about 1500 hours worth of work on it. Um, it's, it was, I'm very proud of it. And I think I, I think any of the listeners for this podcast would absolutely love this ebook because it will provide tremendous value to any martial artist. A lot of the examples in the book are catered towards, um, the splits, for example. Um, so that is something that's, you know, let's just keep it simple. Uh, there's a lot of things I'm selling right now. Um, I got my own brand, Acrobolics, but just check out the ebook. I think that's a good enough value. All right. You know, and, and just to kind of put in a, a plug for that, you know, we've had two other people on the show that have tremendous flexibility. Uh, well, more than, more than that, but two others that are coming to mind that have books on flexibility. Different people can approach the same thing in very different ways and you can have dramatically different results. So if, you know, flexibility is a goal, I mean, your book sh is something people should at least consider and definitely check out because it's free to check it out. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. And if people want to find you online, if they want to track down your social media, if they want to see these tricks that you're throwing up and just kind of get a sense of, to your online persona, how would they do that? The best place is Instagram. Um, that's my strongest social media outlet. Um, just go to Instagram.com slash Jujimufu, J-U-J-I-M-U-F-U. And I have about 500 posts total on there. They're mostly videos of really strange feats of <laughs> strength and comedy. And um, just go down the rabbit hole and, and click on something that has an interesting thumbnail and just do it for a little while. You're going to see a, quite a, a variety of crazy fun things that's um, also impressive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you used the word fun, and I'm glad that you are – willing to be publicly proud of the things that you've accomplished because you are an impressive in individual and I get excited watching your stuff. You know, I, I'd love to say that I've been following you for years, but that's not true. It's only been for the last few months and I just think you're great. You know, I love what, what you're putting out there. I think you've got a great attitude with it and I really appreciate you being on here today. Well, thank you for having me. This has been very enjoyable. It's, I love I've really loved talking about some of these uh, past experiences that have sort of shaped who I am. Well, not sort of that have shaped who I that have shaped who I am. Who I am. My, my martial arts experience have been wholly positive, and just to revisit that now with you has been man, I love it. Thank you, thank Good. you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And I'm going to ask you to bring us out the way I ask everybody. If you could give one piece of advice to the people listening, what would it be? Okay. Um, don't die. There are a lot of ways to develop as a martial artist and even more ways you can use your training. Mr. Call is proof that it doesn't have to continue on the traditional route. I see in him a man who has continued to embrace the martial spirit within his own pursuits while keeping ties to his origin. I've said time and again on this show that martial arts training is unparalleled in developing people for their future. And we see that here yet again. There's more than one way to be a martial artist. Thank you, Mr. Call, for your time on the show. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes and some awesome pictures and videos of Mr. Call. If you haven't seen him in action or you just want to see some photos and videos you may not have before, check it out. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. The username, Whistlekick. You should also check out the Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, behind the scenes. Just do a quick search in Facebook and it's going to come up. We're always open to new guests for the show, so if you want to come on or... You want to recommend somebody else, maybe your instructor, somebody you know, great stories, whatever it is, whoever it is, hit the website, fill out the form, and we'll see if we can make that happen. 
If you like the show, be sure you're subscribing. And if you want to help us out, which, you know, hey, we're feeding you some great shows. Hopefully you're liking them. If you're listening, we assume you like them. You know, reviews, newsletter list, Facebook group, liking the stuff we put out, making a purchase, sharing it with friends. I already said that. <laughs> These are all great ways. The show's growing. The community's growing. We really, really appreciate your time in making that happen. Don't forget the wholesale program we've got, whether it's for you know your school or the school you attend. Hit that wholesale link at the top of whistlekick.com, and let's see if we can get you some gear. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.